Well, let's, uh, let's go for it. Let's, let's uh, start with a word of prayer, shall we? Holy God, we gather again, and we look again to your word. We ask that you would guide us, that you would speak your word to us, that you would help us to encounter you in the midst of your word. For in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, tonight's the night. It's the last night of our study. Uh, and tonight, God is going to speak. For uh, 35 chapters, Job has been crying out for an answer from God. Uh, tonight, he's going to get it, and it's not quite what he's been expecting. <laughs> tonight, we're going to start with chapter 38 and look at the Lord's answer to Job. Uh, before we do that, let me take just a little bit of time and, and summarize where we've been again. Just a quick run through the book up to this point. Uh, remember, Job was introduced back, way back in chapter 1 as a good, upright man. He's a righteous man. He's an obedient man. He's not perfect. Uh, he's a good man. He serves God. That's very important to him. Um, and Satan decides that Job should be tested. Satan goes to God and says, Job's really not that faithful. You have simply bought his obedience. You know, you are so good to Job, you give Job everything, he's not that pious. You take those gifts away from Job, he will curse you to your face. Uh, and God accepts the challenge. God accepts the challenge, and so Job first loses, what, his, his, uh, his wealth uh, and his family, and then in the second four round, he loses his own health. Uh, he is afflicted, his life becomes miserable, uh, and Job does not curse God. Job does not curse God. He gets awfully close to it a few places, uh, but he doesn't, uh, he doesn't curse God. Uh, he, is, uh, he is devastated. He's out in the city uh, dump. Uh, he uh, has sores. He's in horrible health. Uh, three of his friends come to visit him and comfort him. And so the friends come, and Job cries out to them in, their, in his pain. And the friends respond by telling Job that his suffering has to be the result of his sin. Again, we've talked about that. It's, it's a basic doctrine, the retribution doctrine, the retribution dogma, that we get what we deserve. That if we're good, we get good. If we're bad, we get bad. Well, Job is obviously suffering. That means something must have gone wrong. There's got to be some sin that accounts for all that. And so the friends say, Job, whatever it was, repent and return to God. And, and Job says, no, I, I have nothing to repent of. Uh, this is not a result of my sin. Uh, most of the book is this argument between Job and his friends. It does need to be noted, Job has proved Satan wrong. Okay. Satan has said that Job only loves God because of what God gives him. And Job has proven Satan to be a liar. Uh, what is apparent in the book, again and again and again, is that what agonizes Job the most is his problems with God. And it becomes very clear that Job really does love God. There is an authentic relationship between God and human beings. So Job has, has proven Satan wrong, uh, but he has not come through his troubles unscathed. Uh, he has sinned. You know, in the midst of all this, he has sinned. He becomes self-righteous. He calls God unjust. He has not trusted God. He has come through, he has proven Satan wrong, but he's also sinned in the process. Last time we met, uh, two weeks ago, we ended by noting there really is a, a, a rising crescendo in the book of Job. Uh, Job starts out with suffering, he cries out, he argues with his friends, he wins the argument. He defeats his friend. Uh, his friends in the argument, but he really becomes self-righteous in the process. He demands that God listens to him. Job kind of arrogantly demands that, that, that God now answer him. Well, tonight God's going to answer. Tonight God is going to answer, and Job is going to be in for a surprise. So, when in doubt, always hear what the good Lord has to say. <laughs> Chapter 38 is where we pick up the reading. And chapter uh, 38 and 39 are God's answer to Job. 38 and 39, God answers Job. Let me read, uh, oh, the first 15 verses out of chapter 38. 
begins by saying, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I shall question you and you shall declare to me. Okay, Job, you got questions for me? Well, I got a few for you. Gird up your loins, stand up like a man, and I got some questions. God then continues, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sung? Or who laid the cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Or who shut the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and swicks and thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribed bounds for it and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far you shall come and no further, and here your proud wave should be stopped. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place, so that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? It is changed like clay under the, under the seal, and it is dyed like a garment. Light is withheld from the wicked, and their uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? And God goes on and on and on and says, Okay, Job, tell me, how did you create light? Where do you store the snow? How do you make it rain? Uh, tell me about these stars up in the heaven later on. Tell me how you hung all of those. God speaks out of the whirlwind, it says. But it is kind of a strange speech. And it's really not what I would have expected. And at least at first glance, it doesn't seem to be a direct answer to Job's questions. What God speaks of are the marvels and the complexities of creation. He just speaks of the wonders of this universe. Chapters 38 and 39 are this tremendous panorama, just this incredible view of all the wonders of God's world. And so Job's answer is God showing him the wonders of all he's created. My first question is always, does that answer Job? And the answer is, yeah, it does. It does. Move ahead to chapter 40, verse, uh, verse 1 and following. Chapters 38 and 39 are God talking about all the wonders of his creation. Chapter 40 begins, God concludes his speech and says, And the Lord said to Job, Shall a fault finder, shall you a fault finder, contend with the Almighty? Anyone who argues with God must respond. Okay, Job, let's hear your answer. And then Job answered the Lord, See, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand in my mouth, I have spoken once, and I will not answer twice, but proceed no further. In other words, okay, God, I'll be quiet. <laughs> God's answer satisfies Job. For the first time in the book, Job is actually shut up. <laughs> For the first time, he is silenced. Uh, he, he's been answered, he's overwhelmed by God. Uh, like a question, what just happened? And I think the answer is Job gets his perspective. All of a sudden, he realizes that he is not the only pebble on the beach. God is God. And Job has been very presumptuous in challenging God. Uh, Job is now awed, and correctly so, as he sees God's presence and God's wisdom. Notice the change in Job. If you go back to chapter 31, this is probably the height of Job's arrogance. And Job says, oh, that I had one to hear me. Here's my signature. Let God Almighty answer me. Oh, that I had the indictment written out by my adversary. I carry it on my shoulder. I bind it on me like a crown. I give an account of all my steps. Like a prince, I would approach God. Huh. I mean, it's pretty arrogant stuff. Okay, God, tell me what the indictments are, and I'll be right in your face. Now in chapter 40, Job shifts a few gears. Huh. <laughs> See, I have small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I've spoken once. I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. So what has happened is, is God shows Job the, 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 the wonders of his creation. And Job is quiet.
question. Question. Hasn't God said much the same thing that the friends said? I mean, haven't the friends said pretty much the same thing? God is wonderful, God is majestic, God is all-powerful, Job, be quiet. Friends have said about the same thing, haven't they? And Job just sloughs it off. Keeps telling the friends they don't know what they're talking about. Why does God's speech make a difference? I mean, this, this is not new material. Elias has been sharing this stuff for the last how many chapters? Now, God says the same thing in Job is awestruck. What happened? I suspect it's not so much what was said as who said it. Uh, not so much what was said as, as, as who said it. Uh, Job all of a sudden is no longer facing words about God. He's facing God. And he realizes in that moment that he has nothing to say. All of a sudden, he faces the reality of God, not words about God, and that's overwhelming. John Stensrock, who I've quoted many, many times, uh, has a quote that all of a sudden I love, and that is that revelation is personal, not propositional. Revelation, our meaning of God, is always personal, it's not propositional. I like that. Now, what I think Stensvog means is that faith is not just an academic assent to certain doctrines. Uh, it is not just saying, yeah, I agree with certain propositions about God. It is rather encountering the living God. Faith is not just an exercise in philosophy and reason. It's personal. It's being touched by the hand of God. It's realizing that God is God, and God finally is the one who controls the world. And so what's happened is Job has heard all these words before, it doesn't matter, but now he recognizes that God is the one speaking the words, and he is overwhelmed. God answers Job with God's presence. And that's the answer Job needs. That's the answer he needs. Uh, let's see. The Bible says, goes on to say that God's speech brings Job a conviction of sin. And I think that's right. Job realizes that what he has said has been sinful. I suspect it also brought Job uh, a realization of joy. That, yeah, God the universe does still care and does still speak. And so I think he probably feels guilty and joyful all at the same time. Well, that's chapter 38 and 39. God speaks. Job repents. Should be the end of the book, right? Yeah, should about do it. It's, uh, the chapter that I mean, that should take care of it. Doesn't end there. Chapters 40 and 41, God does the same thing. Chapter 40 and 41, Job's going to get about the same speech all over again. God is going to continue to reiterate that he is the God of all creation, going to say very, very much the same thing. And I... I have to confess that when I, usually when I read Job, I kind of get the feeling of overkill. It's like, you know, dear Lord, he's, he's down, stop kicking him. You know, just, you've, you've made your point, he's on his knees, you don't have to pull, you know, it's it just kind of, okay, that, that, you know, that, that, you got him, that's enough, yeah. But I think what the author is trying to do is strike a balance. Remember, this is Hebrew poetry. And one of the things that's very important in Hebrew poetry is, is balance and repetition. And so if you go back to the beginning of the book, God has twice uh, expressed confidence in Job. Satan comes to God twice and, 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 and says, Job doesn't love you, and God twice says, yeah, he does. Now at the end of the book, God twice chastises Job. And so I think the reason for the second speech is to just add some balance. Uh, to my modern sensibilities, you really don't need it. Uh, for Hebrew poetry, it, it has an effect of balance in the book. And so I, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a poetic means of, of, of emphasizing everything. Well, chapter 40, God is going to do it again. Uh, let, me, uh, let me continue on with, uh, with chapter 40. I did those opening verses. Uh, chapter 40, the Lord says to Job, should a fault finder contend with the Almighty, anyone who argues with God must respond. And Job says, I'm of small account. Uh, I lay my hand in my mouth. I have spoken once. I want an answer twice, no further. And then, verse 6, here we go again. 
Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Gird up your loins like a man. He said that already. <laughs> I will question you and you will declare to me, will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be justified? Have you an arm like God? Can you thunder with a voice like his? Deck yourself with majesty and dignity. Clothe yourself with glory and splendor. Pour out the overflowings of your anger. Look at all who are proud and abase them. Look at all who are proud and bring them low. Tread down the wicked where they stand. Hide them all in the dust together. Bind their faces in the world below. Then I will acknowledge you and I will give your own right hand and give you victory. God basically says the same thing. Job, if you're so self-sufficient, if you have the ability to question me and challenge me, then why don't you just take over running the universe for a couple of days? You know, just, just take over and see, uh, see, see how it goes. And the implication is clear. No one, not even a good man like God, like Job, has any basis for challenging God. Uh, when it comes to standing before God, none of us have a leg to stand. Well, there's an interesting section. The next verses in uh, chapter 40 are uh, kind, of, kind of, oh, you've this already. Uh, the next verses in chapter 40 are, are kind of fun. Uh, two creatures get introduced. First, in 4015, there is Behemoth. Look at Behemoth, which I just, uh, which I made just as I made you. It eats grass like an ox. Its strength is in its loins, its power is in its muscles, and its belly. Uh, it makes a tail stiff like a cedar. Its sinews of its thighs are knit together. Its uh, limbs are like bars of iron. It was the first of the great acts of God. Only its maker can approach it. Uh, sounds a little bit, sounds a little bit like a hippopotamus. Uh, verse 40, or chapter 41, he then uh, introduces Leviathan. Can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook or press down its tongue with a cord? Can you put a rope in its nose or pierce its jaw with a hook? Uh, in other words, God says, can you take care of Behemoth and Leviathan? And the uh, first question we have to ask is, who are Behemoth and Leviathan? <laughs> and, and Job scholars have argued over that for, for centuries. Some scholars uh, think it actually is. It's a hippopotamus and a, and, a, and a crocodile. And so what God is saying is, okay, Job, you're so great. Here's two animals I created, hippopotamus and a, and a crocodile. Take over. You know, tell me how you created them. You, you come to terms with them. Tell me, tell me if you can control the hippopotamus. You know, it's just God again putting it in, in, in his place. Uh, other scholars think that Behemoth and, and Leviathan are actually more than that. They're kind of mythological chaos monsters. That they're, they're symbols of the chaos in creation. And if you read through Psalms, uh, there actually are some mentions of these, of these critters. And, and what they are is, biblically, they're kind of, kind of undersea monsters that are just symbols of the, of the forces of chaos in, in the world. Uh, whatever they actually are, what God is saying is, I'm the one who controls all this stuff. Uh, I control the animals, I control the chaos. Uh, Joel, if you want to try to control these things, go right ahead. But God's statement is, I'm the one who finds them and give order. Notice, Job has been saying all along, God is unjust. You know, God just is not just. Now God responds by saying, wait a minute, Job. I'm the only one that's keeping order in the universe. You know, take it back in here. I'm the only one, finally, uh, that, is, uh, that is keeping order here. And again, the gist of the second speech is the same as the first. God alone is in control of the universe, uh, and God doesn't need to answer. And again, Job submits. Job again submits. Uh, chapter, start of chapter 42. Job answered the Lord, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel about knowledge? That's a quote that Job had uttered earlier. Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Here and I will speak, I will question you, will you declare to me? I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. And so now Job is truly contrite. He repents. No, he is not repenting of any gross sins that he had done before his calamity. He was a righteous man. But he is repenting of what he said in the midst of his calamity. God is unjust. God is not to be trusted. God is out to get me. All of those indictments Job now realizes are wrong. Uh, and he realizes that being faithful now is, is trusting God in the midst of everything, even with appearances to the contrary. 
three observations. Three observations about this chapter. Uh, first one is, it, and I love this, the answer for Job. The answer for Job is not an intellectual answer, but a religious one. Job never learns why he suffered. He never gets to read the prologue. Job never learns why he suffered, and it is God, not a logical explanation, that brings peace to his heart. Job's answer was not sight and understanding, but faith. It's not an intellectual answer that satisfies uh, Job. It is the very presence of God that satisfies Job. And I suspect we've probably got some people here that can relate to that. Huh? I see that in pastoral work all the time. You know, tragedy strikes, and the first question we ask is, why? You know, God, where are you? What are you doing? And we usually don't get that why question answered. But what happens is people move beyond the question Find a peace in God that is beyond all logical explanation. In fact, we've got a gorgeous phrase for that in our liturgy. In our liturgy, we talk about the peace of God that passes all understanding. I love that. The peace of God that passes all understanding. I finally don't understand what's going on here, but somehow God's got me in the midst of it. And I can't give you all the answers, and I don't need to, because I know whose hands I'm residing in. Job's answer is finally not to his head, but to his heart. Let me stop there. Does that, does that make sense? Is that something that, that, that makes sense to you out of your experience? The more I read that, I try to understand God with my head, uh, and I never get there. <laughs> I get some headaches trying to do that. But what actually, what satisfies me, what keeps me going, is, is the heart knowledge. That, that, that in faith, I realize I'm in a relationship with a God who cares for me. And, and that, that carries me. So first observation, Job's answer is not an intellectual one, but a religious one. Uh, second one, Job's light in release comes not through a human being and not through a human speech, but it seems to come through nature. God shows Job all the glories of creation, and that's where Job encounters God. Some scholars have suggested that uh, maybe what the author is doing is verbalizing his own spiritual experience. That God spoke to Job not so much by, by, by words, but just by seeing the glories of creation. And I, I can relate to that. You know, I've seen some gorgeous sunsets and sunrises and been in the mountains and seen, and you know, you just, it just kind of explodes and say, yeah, God is here. You know, it might have been some experience like that. Uh, don't know. But somehow the interest connected to it all. Uh, and whether it's by direct speech, whether it's by its, uh, a, a spiritual experience, uh, Job again recognizes the Lordship of God. And the third observation, this one, I, I, I love to, Job is still sick. He's still in the garbage heap, huh. but he no longer complains. And why not? Because he knows that he has God, and with God he is rich. Questions on that? So far, so good. I always worry when there's no questions. It either means I've been perfectly clear, <laughs> or I've got everybody so befuddled they don't even know where to start. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not going to ask which it is. But let's uh, let's let's uh, finish the book and look at look at the epilogue. There's the the, uh, the conclusion to the book, uh, and this actually is, is has got some very significant stuff. Uh, Forty-two. Uh, chapter 42, verse, uh, uh, verse 10. Uh, and notice, it shifts back to prose now. The, the prologue, the introduction was, was, was prose, and now we've had, what, uh, like 30, almost 40 chapters of poetry. Now the very end, the last page, goes back to, uh, goes back to prose. Uh, verse 7. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Terminite, My wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken to me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now therefore take seven bulls and seven rams, and go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering, and my servant Job shall pray for you. And I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly. 
for you have not spoken to me what is right, as my servant Job has done. So Eliphaz the Terminite and Dodad the Shuite and Zophar the Namathite went and did what the Lord told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayers. Isn't that marvelous? Huh? I mean, it's just kind of, Job has accepted his medicine. He has repented of the sin that he has committed. Uh, now God comes to Job's side and backs up Job's basic claim against his friends. Job says, or God says to the friends, Job has spoken rightly of me all along. Uh, his suffering was not due to, uh, to any great suffering that he went, or any great sin that he committed. The friends, the pious ones, are now condemned, and Job the heretic is commended. I just, I, I just kind of love that. And then I, I love really the next part. Job says, by the way, friends, I will forgive you, but only if Job asks for it. Isn't that just marvelous? I mean, his three friends have spent most of the book banging on their Bible saying, this proves to, to you, Job, that you are a sinner. And now God enters a conversation and says, no, you three are the sinners, and I will forgive you, but Job's got to ask for it. It's just kind of a fun little reversal. And I guess it reminds me when I am too pious and too busy pointing out somebody else's faults that maybe I need to be just a little bit careful because I can end up in the same situation pretty quick. Anyway, Job does. He prays for his friends and they are forgiven. Uh, but the church tradition picks that up. And Job becomes known as a great intercessor. That Job becomes kind of one of the saints that, that, that can pray for people. Question. Does suffering in the life of a child of God result in a more effective prayer life? Does suffering in the life of a child of God result in a more effective prayer life and ministry? And the answer is yeah. It very often does. It, not always. Uh, but very often going through the valley ourselves uh, increases our ability to, uh, to minister to others and, to, uh, and for our own prayer life. That somewhere there in the valley we discover more of God. And that's exactly what, the, what Joel went through. So, Job gets his friends forgiven. Then the very end of the book, and this is, a, see what you want to do with this ending. Uh, starts with verse, verse 10. One more here. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then there came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before, and they ate bread with him in his house, and they showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than the beginning, and he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camel, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. He named the first uh, Jemiah, the second uh, Kizia, and the third Kir. Uh, oh, I'm not even going to try that. <laughs> In all the land, there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father gave them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and children's children, four generations, and Job died old and full of days. <clears throat> so Job is now restored to prosperity. He is given double what he had before. Does anybody else hear that as kind of a letdown? There was a great Job scholar that calls it kind of the great anticlimax. I mean, and my problem is that it just doesn't seem realistic. You know, I know of a lot of people that have gone through the valley, but that climbing back up to the heights doesn't always happen. It's like the book takes us back to where we began, and, and it kind of implies that it pays to be good. Is there anybody else that, anybody else kind of do a double take when they read that? And that that's, I, I would kind of, I, I think what the author is trying to do, uh, and remember the author does not have a doctrine of the resurrection to work with. At this time in Jewish thought, they have not, uh, they don't understand that there's going to be a resurrection. And so the problem the author has is he wants to express the truth that God will win out in the end. And that God's people will be vindicated in the end. And the only way he has to express that is in materialistic terms. He wants to tell us that yes, we will suffer, you will win in the end. I, I, I suspect in our day, uh, the language we would use is, yes, you will suffer, but there will be a resurrection where you will share the full glory of God. I mean, we use that language. We 
Certainly, we certainly use that language. And I think that's true. Um, the problem that, uh, that uh, the author has is he doesn't have a resurrection to work with. <laughs> Uh, and so he wants to say that, yes, God wins in the end. God's people will always be vindicated. And the way he ends up doing that is with a, with, with a materialism. Yeah, Jim? This is not important, but what do you do with a thousand donkeys? I was going to say, yeah, you, you don't need it. <laughs> this is the Yeah, the numbers, you go through the numbers, and it's like, you know, that, that, okay, God, thank you. But yeah, maybe this isn't a blessing. Like, oh, no, what, it's, uh, uh, yeah, a thousand donkeys. Uh, the the fourteen thousand sheep, six thousand six thousand camels. Yeah, what do you do with them? Yep, yep. I mean, the, the numbers just get a little crazy. Yeah, and I, th I think the point is again that, that God will vindicate His people. God will vindicate His people. And the uh, at bottom, if if Job were written nowadays, I would probably talk in terms of a resurrection. You know, that, that this is what this is what awaits. Okay, so that, that's a conclusion. You, you, you with me on that? Question. Does the ending reinstate the retribution doctrine? Okay. Does the ending reinstate the retribution doctrine? Remember, the issue in the book is the retribution doctrine. The good, good, good will get good, bad will get bad. Uh, Job has just spent 40 chapters refuting that, saying that is not always the case. Okay. Question. Are we back to that? Are we back to that? Only if you live long enough. Only if you live long enough, it'll work, okay? If you live long enough, okay. Let me suggest we're not back to the retribution doctrine because there is something really radically different going on here. And that is the retribution doctrine is works theology. Right? We get what we deserve. It's works theology. You will get that which you earn. You've been good, you get good. You've been bad, you get bad. We get what, we earn, what we've earned. We, we earn our own blessings. Notice, at the end of Job, Job's blessings are a gift of sheer grace. Job hasn't earned anything. In fact, he is a sinner. He is unworthy. Job says, I despise myself. Job recognizes that he is nothing, has nothing to offer God. And yet it is on the sinner that God now bestows his gifts. The unworthy one is now blessed by God solely as an act of God's grace and love. It's kind of a surprise ending. Namely, that now the sinful one, the one who acknowledges his own sin, is now blessed and prosperous as a free gift of God. That, my friends, is what we as Lutherans call grace. Huh. St. Paul hasn't written his books yet about how grace is central, but Job's got it. Huh. That one of the incredible newses of the Bible is that God blesses sinners like Job and you and me. It's not what we deserve. It's not retribution doctrine. It's a gift of grace. Benji? Did he not pray for his friends that God blessed him? Question. If Job had not prayed for his friends, would God have blessed him? I don't know. I don't know. It is interesting the way that's worded. I mean, it seems like the prayers, uh, the prayers for the... Uh, for the friends are essential. I don't know. I don't, don't know. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends. I don't know. I think uh, if Job, I, I would think it's safe to say that, if, that if, if Job had not been able to forgive his friends, he never would have found the healing he needed. You know, one of the neat things about forgiveness is it always heals us as much as it does the other person. And so if, if Job can move into forgiveness, uh, then I guess in a sense he's never going to find a, find a, find forgiveness of for fullness of life. You know, when you can't forgive, that finally eats away at you as much, at least as much as the other person. So interesting. Yeah, is that is that is that part of what Joel needs to do in his own terms? Other responses to that? Other? I just find it it's an interesting twist. 
that, that, you know, they're arguing all along the good get blessed, and now at the end, it's the sinners that get blessed. But, boy, Paul, St. Paul's going to pick up on that in the Testament and turn that into what we Lutherans call justification by grace through faith. Beautiful, beautiful theme in the Bible. So, the epilogue. A couple of points. A couple of points. I, see, I think it says, number one, God is good, in spite of all appearances to the contrary. That there will be times in your life when you really doubt the goodness of God. And what the epilogue says is God is good, in spite of all appearances. And, uh, and second, I think it says that we now live by faith. Someday that faith will be turned into sight. We now live by faith. Someday that faith will be served, turned into sight. Most likely for us it will be in a resurrection, not quite as Job experienced it. But the day will come when we, uh, when we experience when we experience our faith as, 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 as sight. One last quote. And this is uh, always John Stenfog's summary of the book of Job. I think it's probably in the Bible space I've handed out. Uh, but Stenfog uh, concluded most of his studies by saying, Job suffered much, not for any fault of his own, but for purposes hidden from him. As a byproduct of the suffering, Job deepened his knowledge of God, as have millions of readers through Job. And he say that God is unjust. What is behind the book is the love of God. And that's all I know about Job. So <laughs> let me let me, uh, let me stop and ask uh, ask for uh, ask for questions. Nobody would choose that suffering. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, do you, do you like what God does with Job? You know, I, 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 would you, I wouldn't choose it. Uh, what, the question that intrigues me is, do, does God call me to that? You know, does God call me, does God call us to that? That, that? that God's involvement in Job's life leads to suffering for the sake of others. What in the world does that look like? And talk about, talk about a corrective to our modern Christianity. You know, modern Christianity, at least in this country, is, is pretty much feel-good Christianity. You know, I like to be Christian because it makes me feel good, and I'm going to get a better life, and, and you know, I'm going to pick what I want, me, 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 me. And, and Job said, eh, deeper than that. You are called into new life by the living God, and he will take care of you and guide you. Uh, but you better know there's some crosses along the way. There's some crosses along the way, and fullness of life will involve suffering. It's a different understanding than we usually have in the, in the, in the at least in the American churches. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is this is the, this is what Luther called theology of the cross: that faithfulness will lead to suffering. You now, the good news is that God has God does His best work through crosses. You know, God God does His best work when 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 it's Good Friday and all of a sudden it turns into Easter. Uh, so there there you know there there's there's an answer for that, but. Yeah. 
And, and that's, that's, yeah. In fact, there, there's, some, uh, there's some New Testament passages where they thank God for the privilege of suffering. That they have matured to a point where God is willing to invest in them and let them suffer. Who? <laughs> think of that for the modern church. Yeah. Who? Uh, Blaine. Uh, Blaine Davis preached a sermon on that, uh, and, and he talked about that that uh, you know conflicts and problems in the congregation might actually be a healthy thing. You know, you know, if, if the church is really healthy, there's never any issues. And da, 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 da. And, and Blaine was saying, well, maybe that's our time in the wilderness. Maybe congregations have to go through that wilderness time as God purifies and eventually you do get to the promised land. But it's in that suffering and struggle that you learn what it is to be faithful. Oh, does that not work with any of the self-help books you're going to get on congregational life over at Barnes and Nobles? <laughs> but it might work for Scripture. What's that look like for us? For, 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 well, for us, for, for congregations, individually, corporately. Interesting questions. Interesting. Interesting questions. Other other thoughts? It, it is. I mean, that's one of my. And I read Job, and my question is always: oh, is, is, is this fair to Job? You know, in, it, is this is this fair to Job? Uh, and I think the answer is God's got a much bigger picture in mind. You know that that I I tend to think very individualistically. Is it fair to me? And, and I think one of the things Job says is it, it's a bigger picture. There's a, whole, there, there, there's a whole community there. There's a whole that maybe what I suffer benefits somebody else. And oh, the other, I would say to you, know, I don't know that the suffering for the sake of others to find fullness of life is, is such a foreign concept to us. Uh, and and, and my, 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 where I say that is, uh, ever been a parent? <laughs> I mean, parenting involves probably more suffering than any other thing I've undertaken. You know, you, you, when they're little, they wait, you, you go through uh, weeks with no sleep. Uh, you, you know, then they turn teenagers and you go through months with no sleep. You know, it, 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 I mean, it, 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 it's a giving, it's, it's, a, it's a suffering, it's, it's an emptying of yourself. And yet, it, I think I'd say it's the most rewarding thing that I've ever experienced. You know, somehow through that suffering love, that giving love, I find a whole new life. So I, I, I think we've got some analogy. We kind of parts of life we know how that works. And how do you, you know, how do we keep going down that path? Well, yeah. I will say this: that parenting doesn't end with children. Yeah, I had that naive, naive idea, too. I get my last one through high school that we were done. Yeah. Now you just worry about them long distance. Yeah, we're yeah. great grandchildren now. And it, it, it doesn't get any easier. Yeah. yeah. But it is, it is somehow suffering, suffering and joy are not out there. They, they somehow connect. And, and we experience that, I think, in our lives. And, and Joel brings that together. After that last sentence up there, pretty much explains it all, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's the, the love of God that pulls it all together. It looks like Satan is pulling all the strings, and in the end, it's God. It's God who's done it. Who did uh, I just ran into that in? Uh, oh, we were we had the the meeting in Columbus, and one of the one of the uh, the uh, uh, pastors up there said his analogy of God is a master weaver. You know, people are, 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 you know, they weave all these beautiful things. Uh, and, he, and he said that, you know, we, we, we make our mistakes and, and we goof things up and we don't do things right. And God in his grace just manages to work all that into what he finally creates as a masterpiece. That, you know, yeah, we sin, yeah, we blow it. And, and, and somehow, and, and we don't want to minimize that, but somehow God is even able to weave that in. But it's a neat illustration for God. That is just a, kind of like that. Be like if there wasn't Satan. <laughs> if we didn't have Satan out there doing his dirty works. That's an injury. If we, yeah, what would it be like if we didn't have Satan? Yeah, I mean, that for God to my, give us my, his grace against all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, my flip answer is we human beings might take over the job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> I guess I guess that's how it happened. No else. Which is which is yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 
That's, I'm never sure where human evil leaves off and Satan begins. Yeah. You know, I can never quite, you know, you see some of the crazy things that people are capable of. And, and where, where is it human evil, where is it Satan? You know, you, World War II, you know, the, the, the Holocaust and all that. that you know, where, where, where was that human evil? And, and, and where do you say it's satanic? I, I'm not sure, but, it, but it's sure a mess. Yeah, yeah. yeah unfortunately, it's very common. Yeah. Where did I see it? Sunday morning show. They were saying how many ordinary people in Germany actually participated. Mm -hmm. That it was not isolated to <coughs> famous camps. That mm -hmm. there were thousands of camps, neighborhood camps. Yeah. Yeah. That it was it was so common that there's there's no excuse. There was no one back then. Uh, uh, oh, uh, Eberhard Baker, uh, the closest friend of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I heard speak years ago, uh, and he said most most of our most of us chose to be stupid. Mm -hmm. We just chose we didn't want to know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. what's going on right now in the world. I mean, it's what it is. Yeah. Every day you look at that. People are just out now. <laughs> Well, let's leave it at that. Please, I think if Job does anything, it keeps you pondering. Uh, thank you for your patience and everything. Let's close with a word of prayer, shall we? Lord, we continue to come with questions and wondering, and we confess that we will do that for as long as we're on this earth. And yet we thank you that you continue to hold us and guide us and support us. Remind us of that again and again. We need that assurance. And, and lead us always closer to you. Remind us that you are the one who gives life and, and you give that abundantly. For in your name we pray. Amen.